Hi, good morning, everyone. Welcome. We're here today for our Age-Friendly Health Systems 4M training for healthcare practitioners. And this is the second module of four that we are hosting together with the South Florida Geriatric Workforce Enhancement Program. We're so happy to have you here joining us today for this session. I'm Isabel Rovira. I am the co-founder and CEO of Urban Health Partnerships. We are a nonprofit that's focused on health equity. And today we're so happy to be able to share with you uh, this training series, uh, two of four. And we're focusing on the 4M framework that was developed by the Institute for Healthcare Improvement. The objectives for the series, uh, the entire series are first to understand the needs for age-friendly health systems, second to communicate the age-friendly health systems 4M model, and lastly to identify your scope, role, and opportunities to practice the 4Ms in the healthcare setting. And as I mentioned, we are in part two of four. Last week, we had a great introduction to the age-friendly health systems, as well as the need for age-friendly health systems and its context within the age-friendly movement, social movement. So thinking about age-friendly communities, age-friendly public health, and then this age-friendly health systems, which is focused on the healthcare portion, which is very, very important. Um, this week, we're focusing on two of the Ms. Uh, the 4M framework, and those two are going to be what matters and mobility. We have two really amazing speakers with you today, uh, Lil Banchero and Christine Wazinski, and I'm going to introduce to you our first speaker, Lil Banchero. She is currently the Senior Nurse Director at the Institute for Healthy Aging at Anne Arundel Medical Center. Lil has 20 years of leadership at the center, which is a magnet designated 385 bed institute for patient and family centered exemplar hospital. She has managed a 30 bed acute care for the elderly nursing unit for over 12 years and brought it to uh, Nietzsche to designation to AM AAMC. Since 2017, she has led her organization's work with the Institute for Healthcare Improvements and the Hartford Foundation to test ideas and learn what it takes to be an age-friendly health system. Anne Arundel is one of five pioneer health systems involved in the work with the 4Ms framework, an age-friendly care that is both evidence-based and put into practice reliably in healthcare settings. We're so honored and excited to have you here today, Lil, to talk about what matters most, which is one of the most important Ms and really ties into every other one. So I will pass it over to you. Thank you for being here. Oh, you, you're on mute. <laughs> oh, sorry about that. Still can't get that right. So <laughs> thanks so much for having me. And so um, you can kind of see my background. I'm kind of setting the tone for what matters. So uh, to me, what matters to me are my two delicious granddaughters, Noelle and Nora, five and two. And um, if you would, if I was in the hospital room right now. and turn, on my turn down. My whiteboard would see my names of my two grandchildren. So I want to kind of run you through a little bit of our background and then the things that we've done to promote for the four M's, especially what matters. Because to us, what matters was the, the first M that we really concentrated on because we felt that what matters drives the whole care plan for patients. Lil, I don't hear you anymore again. I'm so sorry. Okay, wait a minute. Do you hear me now? Yes. I'm sorry. I don't, I don't know what I'm doing. Keep my hands to myself. <laughs> so, um, so we tell a lot of stories. Stories are really important because families, staff, physicians all relate to these stories, not just about disease, but about who these people are and making connections with our, our patients and families. But with the, what you can see is this was a gentleman who was 98 and the little legs next to him is his wife who was 84. Uh, he came to us first on the ACE unit with uh, dementia and a UTI. And unfortunately, three days later, she wound up on the med surge unit below us uh, and had surgery. Um, 
but she was his caregiver and she was with him in the beginning. And we noticed the days that he, she wasn't there. He was much more agitated, much more wandering. Um, so we started taking him upstairs or downstairs to the med surgery unit so we could see her. And uh, he, it, the whole atmosphere just calmed down because he was with somebody he knew forever. And then we said, this is crazy. So then we just brought her upstairs to the ACE and we put them together for the next uh, four days of their recovery. Uh, they had their meals together. They watched TV together. They napped together. Um, and uh, they went home together. So we really believe that finding out what mattered, knowing that, that she was his caregiver and that he relied on her changed the course, we think. And actually probably um, reduced their length of stay, we like to believe. Next slide, so please. Just to give you a little background, when we back in 13, when we were building uh, a new tower, which was uh, four more inpatient units, it's like, what do we really gonna, how do we best serve the community? And the one thing we didn't have was a focus on geriatric care. And as you can see, we're the third largest hospital in the state of Maryland with the highest admission rates of 65 and older. Next slide, please. So in 13, we understood that gap and that there is a difference taking care of older people. There's a unique, they have unique needs. And I don't think, uh, and we weren't paying attention to that in acute care for sure. Um, so in 13, we opened a 13 bed, a 30 bed uh, uh, ACE unit. And that was our cutting ceremony, but those were all advisors and patients that were involved at the center of, uh, of this uh, unit. Next slide, please. Just a real quickie from 13 to 16. This is where we knew we had to do, because we really did not have good education for geriatric care. So we seized this opportunity on the ACE unit to really drive geriatric education. Uh, we became niche designated. Uh, we, almost half of this staff is geriatric certified. We have mandatory annual geriatric education for an hour at least. Um, we involve all our uh, interdisciplinary team members to work with us. And then we began our work with all these, the things of mobility, sleep disturbance, palliative care and elder abuse. Next slide, please. So then in 17, that's when we really got tagged to do real work. I mean, we thought we were just the cat's meow. We were getting people up out of bed every day and we were, but you know what, we were getting people up every day, but that's where they sat for 12 hours was in that chair. You know, we weren't thinking mobility and we weren't thinking about, we weren't um, monitoring or uh, screening for delirium. But, but in the beginning, what really did it was we had the IHI and um, Harford come and speak to our C-suite. And when they were done speaking, the C-suite was like, how could we not do this work? This is, this is just perfect framework. So, um, so we, from the beginning, we had a great C-suite commitment and we engaged when we were doing the work and traveling to Boston every couple months, we made sure we took a hospitalist one time or a physician, a pharmacist, so that all the interdisciplinary, there was somebody from the ground level watching all this work that we were developing so that there was a real buy-in from the beginning. Um, the resources, the collaboration and the encouragement of the IHI has just been fantastic, always uh, supportive. Uh, Christine's gonna be talking to you guys later. I don't know how many times I've begged her to help me with delirium. Uh, you know, there's a whole um, structure of, uh, of resources out there. And again, using what matters as the 4M driver. Next slide, please. So, you know, many years ago, we didn't have all this innovation. We just had compassion and kindness for patients. Um, and then we became innovative and we got better outcomes. But I think what happened along the way, we lost the, the connection between provider and patients. Um, so we really are patient centered and we routinely involve patients and families in their care. And this is one of our advisors. He's a 98 year old Chuck. Uh, he came to one of our nursing um, fairs and this was his idea. He wanted to sit in the gown with his little sign to say, don't forget me, I'm here. He was a paramedic for us for years in the county. And it's like, you don't do anything without asking me first. So that's kind of our mantra is uh, nothing without me and involving uh, 
patients in their care. Next slide, please. And this is just, just to emphasize from the very beginning, we did this as a team. So on ACE, we did a lot of quick experiments. You know, we, we did a thing on watering cups. You know, those little pink cups that fall, they're so little and flimsy and the pink water jug. Well, when you're 85, that's not gonna work to make sure that you're hydrated. So we, you know, went through some different kinds of drinking cups. We did things about vital signs. So we could do these rapid, rapid experiments on in there and see what worked and see what didn't. And what was really cool is the little guy that's sitting there was a photographer in Annapolis forever. But one of his biggest anxieties here was that, and he had dementia, but he had cats that he adored and he could not get to those cats. And he, he just worried about them all the time. So we have these little mechanical cats that we have on the unit. And he carried that cat with him. In fact, we let him take it home because it was like uh, he became really attached. But it really changed the course of his care because even though he had dementia, he was a little bit more attentive and we could um, uh, you know, connect with him a little bit better. Next slide, please. And then just sending the spreading the word around. You know, we did a lot of um, presentations to all the councils that would listen to us. We went on local radio. We went out to the community to assisted livings. We incorporate the 4Ms uh, framework and orientations for our new residencies, for our new nurses, that this is not just a one and done thing. This is part of our culture. Next slide, please. Of course, when you have these kind of resources and expertise to come and talk to you and to your organization, this just really ignites um, interest and yeah, let's get going, let's get do it. So all these fantastic folks have come at one time or another to talk about the 4Ms or dementia or delirium or, um, uh, and have really sparked um, you know, the movement to keep going. And we were just lucky enough six months ago to, to get our, our geriatrician, which you know, this is our first geriatrician and we are just so excited about moving forward with um, more geriatric work with her help leading the realm. Next slide, please. Just a little thing. This is one of the things we did when we were getting ready to go to the acute care and, and you know, really infuse this work outside of the ACE unit into the other acute cares, other acute units. We came up with this cute little idea of the four M's. We took M&M's and then we color coded all the um, M's and then we, we laminated these little cards and then we put little bags of M&Ms and that's how we kind of walked around and to all the units to talk about it. We call it the coffee cart and they would get their M&Ms and they would get their little cards. So it was just a fun kind of activity that we did. Uh, and of course, everybody likes M&Ms. Next slide, please. Just another way, this was our coffee cart. You can see we go around with uh, education to the units with uh, food and drink that always entices nurses and staff to come to you. And then we could um, educate them on the four Ms. We send nurses every year to the niche conference, wherever it is, uh, a great place for them to come back and implement new process improvements for geriatrics. If you ever have an opportunity to do a virtual dementia tour with your staff, that is very, very powerful. Uh, we even had our police department, our fire department, Department of Aging come through we do this every quarter where you have the symptoms of dementia, uh, your, your hearing's muffled, your sensory, your fingers are in gloves, your eyes are uh, blurry, and then you're asked to go into a room and open uh, a medicine bottle or button your shirt. And it's very difficult to do that. Um, so it's a really powerful interactive um, adventure and very popular. Next slide, please. I'm shameful, I'm shameful grandmother. So here are my, my, my granddaughters again, um, that matter to me. Next slide, please. So really what we're doing is shifting away from disease and back to patient and families with the, four, with the what matters. People will say, well, I feel funny asking what matters. Okay, so as nurses and providers, we know what is the matter with you. You have hypertension, you've got congestive failure, whatever, we know what's the matter with you, but what matters to you as a person? How do we make that personal connection? So I tell folks, you don't need to go in and say what matters to you if you're uncomfortable with that. Use other 
questions like, what's important to you today? What are you worried about? What would make a really great day? It's, it's a placeholder to make the connection. You can ask almost whatever you want to the person and that's gonna make a connection and a conversation. And that's what we're looking for. Next, next slide, please. So kind of broke it down a little bit. These are questions in the acute care when you've just been admitted, you're here for a couple of days. What is your immediate, what's today? What is it today that we could do today to make you happy? What are you worried about? What's a great day? These are all good questions. Next slide, please. So let me tell you, this is, um, this is Dorothy. What's wrong with Dorothy is she has hypertension, diabetes, and heart failure. But what, what matters to Dorothy today is that she watch a movie and eat some popcorn. Next slide, please. Um, and then these are longer term goals. These are where we're starting to get into uh, transitions of care, what a palliative care, what do you want for your future? What do you want to happen in your future? Um, what, what do you worry about if, if you should, uh, things are not getting better for you? So a little bit longer term goals. Next slide, please. And I just wanna let you know, this was a patient of our 71 years old who um, had um, advanced uh, cancer and a really great guy and everybody wanted to keep Hoyt alive. I mean, they just didn't want him to give up and we can do this and we can beat this, but it wasn't gonna be. And he just kept saying, please, I just want to, I'm done fighting, I'm done. So when the conversation really became and people then supported him and he went into hospice and he passed. But what was so inspiring to the ACE unit was that in the obituary there was, they asked the family to actually send contributions to the ACE unit for the work that they do. So that was a very special, but again, Families don't want, we don't want our loved ones to pass, but it's not what we want. It's what the patients want. Next slide, please. Emergency department. Well, people think you shouldn't ask what matters with the emergency department because you're too busy. You got to get in, you got to get out. But probably one of the best places to ask somebody to relieve anxiety and to put a focus on is in the ED. It's a, it's a crazy, loud, busy place. But if somebody takes one second in the ER to say, what are you worried about today for your visit? What a connection and what that would really do to that patient's anxiety. <clears throat> Next slide, please. So just some of the things for intervention as everybody started way back 20 years ago with the little uh, whiteboards that I don't know who could ever see them. We went to great big boards and on these boards, you can see we've all made a, all our boards are standardized and what matters is on every board. And we also kind of flipped around, sorry about that, but on the whiteboards in the ED, there is a place. And when we make rounds, part of our rounding is that, that what matters is, um, is present on the board. Next slide, please. And what matters, there really is a what matters day. And actually this year it was yesterday. Um, and a couple of years ago, what we did, and we did it again this year, but without the t-shirts, we put sticky notes, big sticky notes up all over the units. This was outside of our cafeteria way before COVID. And as people came to lunch, they would take a sticky and put what was important to them on the, big, on the wall back there. And then they got a t-shirt and it says, what matters to you matters to me. Just again, to, to keep this in the, what matters up in the forefront and keep it fun and People get very engaged in all kinds of, all these people are, it, what matters to them on this particular day was everybody had something different. Next slide, please. So we also wanted to put our mouth, our money where our mouth was like, uh, this is all great and done, but we have to incorporate this in our um, everyday uh, workflows. So what we came up with was a work plan that anybody that was admitted uh, 65 and older would have a care plan that would automatically drop into the uh, EPIC, into the um, admission nurses uh, in the um, RN navigator uh, for the admission. So when they would go to their care plan, next slide, please. 
this is all the interventions. So they don't have to think much about it. They click on to each. The first one is into individualization that they're gonna be asked what matters question. And then mobility, there'll be a whole screening for mobility. We'll be doing the BCAM with the mentation. And then also with meds, we look at uh, the beers criteria. Next slide, please. Another great story. Chet was a 98 year old guy who came to us, was frequently coming to the hospital, deteriorating and he had a great support family, but they just didn't know, they didn't want to keep coming to the hospital. We had the uh, goals of care conversation. Uh, we gave them some more resources, uh, palliative care, hospice. And on the next page, you can see Chet, that's where he turned 100. So he got to stay home for two more years and turn 100 and really never have to come to the hospital again. So next slide, please. This is just a little something I wanted to show you that we developed with some of the ALFs, the assisted livings. We thought it would be great if we could get these assisted livings to fill these out for the residents. And then if the resident had to come to the ED, um, they would have something that we could look at. Next slide, please. Um, this is just a quick, uh, wanted to show you some data that we do. I can collect data on what matters on every unit. So if you go to maternity, guess what the number one thing is important to them? A baby. If you go to ACE, it's to go home. And if you go to surgery, it's to control the pain. Next slide. Another little story, this lady, that this was her Gigi, her, her one and only, she had no family. She was one of our frequent flyers. And Gigi did stay with her for the course of her four days, which we think accelerated her length of stay to get out. She didn't have to worry about Gigi. Um, I'm gonna skip the next slide because I know I'm running out of time. So just wanna show you real quick, uh, we did push this out to the four, uh, the primary cares, next slide. So in primary care now, there's actually the four M's in their documentation. So they're asking people what matters to them and their daily goals. Next slide, please. We also have the question in my chart. So that before the patient comes to his uh, physician's appointment, there the doctor can see what matters to them before uh, they get to do a one-on-one -on -one to generate a conversation. Next slide, please. Um, this was a really cool thing that we did. We wanted to quantify this somehow. And so we said, what if we took 65 and older, we looked at all of our quality measures readmissions, ED departure, and length of stay. And if we could impact those, looking at 65 and older, they came up with this formula that showed that we could give back 8.9 years of time for patients to be home doing what matters most. It's a great visual, it's a little old, but um, it does, does bring home the fact if we could, if we're listening to our patients of what they really want, we think we can impact all these quality measures. Next slide, please. And just one, it's a powerful que uh, question, what matters, but it's really building relationships and um, connecting. And this was just one of our patients who missed his dog terribly and was convinced that this dog was missing him. So we brought him over, the, we had the family bring him the dog over one day just to say hi, which really he was so good for the next two days and then he got to go home. He wasn't so stressed about his poor dog. Next slide, please. So that's really it. Um, if you have any questions, um, sorry, I had to speed it up there at the end. No problem. Thank you so much, Lil. Um, what amazing work that your institution is doing. It's really inspiring. Um, we are going to do the questions at the end of the, the whole module. So if you have questions, you can already put them in the chat and we'll, we'll take them at the very end. But we really appreciate hearing all of this great work. And we're gonna now go on to the next presentation, which is going to be focused on mobility. And I want to introduce to you, Christine Wazinski. She is currently the coordinator of the Inpatient Geriatric Services ADAPT Actions for Delirium Assessment Prevention and Treatment Age-Friendly Health Systems Inpatient Project of the, Hart the Hartford Healthcare Systems Fall Prevention Committee and NICHE programs at Hartford Hospital in Hartford, Connecticut, where she, is, she functions in the role of geriatric nurse practitioner and clinical nurse specialist. 
She has received several awards for her innovative work in gerontological nursing and has published a book and numerous articles. She is the principal investigator or co-investigator of several research studies focusing on interventions to improve the care of hospitalized older adults. She is the chairperson of the statewide acute care geriatric nursing collaborative and is a sought after presenter at the local, regional, national and international level on topics involving geriatric nursing, delirium and fall prevention. She is currently the president of the American Delirium Society and we're so happy that she's here today to talk to us about mobility and I'll hand it over to you, Christine. Great, thank you. Lisa. So I wanna begin by just thanking Lil for a wonderful presentation and it sets the stage for our discussion on mobility. And truly mobility is medicine. Um, you're, and hopefully you'll see from this presentation that it is one of the core concepts of the four M's uh, that needs to be addressed and will get us the outcomes that these patients really want to happen. Uh, next slide, I have no disclosures to um, speak of. And our learning objectives, we're gonna try to uh, talk about the hazards of immobility across care systems when we have older adults that are experiencing either chronic or acute illness that do impair their ability to move about. Um, I'd like to introduce you to our Safer Mobilization Program, which is a um, mobilization uh, enhancement in a safe way. Uh, that's currently going on in our inpatient settings. And then lastly, I'd like to end by discussing interventions that we can use across care settings to promote um, older adults to move about as uh, much as possible. Next slide. So again, I'm going to be focusing on um, mobility. So um, this was a quote from one of her patients. Uh, she said, I have to get out of here before I become a cripple. Um, so you can see that was what mattered to her. And uh, she was extremely focused on her mobilization, knowing that if she didn't move about the way that she normally did, she was not going to get home. Next slide. So again, uh, when we look at the four M's, the definition of mobility is to maintain mobility and function by ensuring that older adults move safely every day. Uh, prevent and treat complications of immobility. So that's what we're going to focus on. The next slide shows us that uh, there is actually a lack of mobilization of hospitalized older adults in most hospitals. I think this is one of the uh, areas that everyone pretty much struggles with because mobility is often seen as a nicety. It gets put to the bottom of the priority list and uh, the staff and the patients themselves don't appreciate how important that movement is for their recovery. So you can see this study by Brown. Uh, they just uh, took, did a point prevalence study of older adults and uh, went around and said, what are these people doing right now? And you could see the majority of these people were laying in bed, even though they did not have bed rest orders. And I think if you go to most um, units that are not practicing the four M's and not, not age friendly, this is what you're going to see is a lot of people just languishing in bed. Uh, next slide, please. Um, really, um, getting your patient to move about during an illness is really a race against time. Because you can see here that for every minute that they're not moving about in their normal way, they're losing ground. Um, you're gonna, you'll see that in the next slide, all the different things that are going on in the body and um, how it affects overall function. But you can see that loss of strength and balance occur as early as day two. Um, and for every day that a patient spends in bed, it takes three days in a rehab to regain the lost function of that one day. So if you've got somebody on three days of bed rest, now you've bought them nine days in a rehab. Um, so again, very, very important that, us, that we correlate um, mobilization with better outcomes. So the next slide shows you all the potential complications of immobility. I'm not going to go over all these in detail, but you can see it crosses almost all body systems are affected when we don't move about the way that we normally do. And remember, mobilization is not always ambulation. So ambulation is the ultimate mobilization, but we know that even some patients on a good day, when they're not sick and in the hospital, when they're at their functional baseline, are somewhat limited in their mobilization. They may, some, some individuals may only be uh, able to pivot to a chair. Others may be able to just walk short distances, perhaps around their home. 
So we have to really understand what is the patient's baseline when they're not sick and in the hospital. And that's really what we're striving for because we don't want to push them over their limit as well because then we end up with unsafe situations. Next slide. So um, I just thought I'd put this up here. This is um, work by um, Wald et al. Uh, I'm sorry, Crumbs Hold et al. And uh, talks about the post-hospital syndrome. And so this, this is, these are the um, disabilities that people are left with after they are discharged from a acute care, acute care stay in a hospital. And you can see at the top of the list is an effect on their mobilization. And we know from our own work how many patients do have to either go to a rehab facility to recover. And a lot of that is because we just haven't mobilized them to the maximum during their hospitalization. Um, <clears throat> or they need to go home with additional services, again, um, which in many cases can actually be avoided. Uh, and you can see here the work by Wald talks about how one third of older adults um, were actually discharged with a new disability when they came <laughs> into a hospital that they didn't have before and it had nothing to do with their uh, reason for admission. So we really have to pay attention to what are we doing to our seniors. And again, that's the whole tenants behind the 4M practices. Next slide. Um, I love this quote. It talks about how there is no pill to, to actually uh, treat the weakness, the, um, the endurance loss, the fatigue that hospitalized patients ex experience. The pill is mobilizing them. And first of all, trying to prevent that from happening. But when it does happen and they've already experienced this loss of mobility, perhaps even on admission because of being home and sick for a while, that we need to counteract that. <laughs> and the counteraction is mobilization and it's hard work. Next slide. So this was a really interesting study that looked at, um, and at, they asked patients, they asked uh, nurses, and they asked providers, what do they think were the barriers to mobilization during hospitalization? You can see people had a lot, very different perspectives. So the patient themselves were really focused on, I'm too tired, I'm in too much pain, I might fall. Um, from our own work, uh, with our mobility volunteers, and I'll talk about them in a little while, but up to 50% of mobilization um, attempts by our mobility volunteers were refused by patients. And their excuses would be, well, I'm waiting for my doctor to come in. My family's coming in. Um, I, I already walked today. Um, I'm too tired. So you can see that they really did not appreciate um, the importance of the mobilization in their recovery. Um, and so in this study, again, uh, we looked at what the nurses were focused on and they were very um, concerned about uh, the lack of resources that they had to walk these patients. So, you know, I don't, I don't have what I need. I don't have the walker. I don't have the gate belt. Um, I don't have enough support. I need a second person to help me. Uh, the patient has all this equipment. Um, and of course, that the patient might fall. And then the providers also had uh, very similar to the nurses, um, not so much that the equipment was not there, but that they were um, concerned that the patient might fall and also exciting that the patient just doesn't want to move. Next slide. So again, um, Looking at some of the evidence around uh, mobility programs, um, and again, with the ultimate goal of having safe mobilization, um, you can uh, look at the HELP program, which I think many of you are familiar with, which is uh, Dr. Inouye's program, Health Hospital Elder Life. Uh, one of her outcomes that she had from using uh, mo uh, vol volunteers to help with uh, all the different components of her a program um, was to enhance mobilization and to decrease falls. And that's what they found was that there was definitely less cognitive and functional decline in patients that uh, were moved earlier and consistently. Um, and then uh, Brown's work uh, looked at implementing a um, structured progressive mobility protocol. And I'll share what ours looks like in a moment. Uh, and what they found was that the outcomes were definitely much better for uh, the patient's recovery uh, with one, one month following discharge. Next slide um, is going to describe our experience. So um, I happen to be the 
chairperson of our fall prevention committee at Hereford Hospital, as well as the system. So I do spend a lot of time looking at falls and the etiologies, the potential prevention. And um, what we found, and I think this is again, very consistent among other um, hospitals, is that many of our falls actually involve the act of toileting. Um, and that when we really study these falls, um, we are actually um, with the patient many times, but we're not protecting them uh, enough or we're not using enough supports to make their uh, mobilization safe. Um, we also look to see how many of our patients actually review some of our interventions, whether that's accompanying them into the bathroom so that they're safe, or um, asking them to help let us put a gate belt on them and to uh, stay with them while we're walking them. We also have found that our patients are undermobilized. Again, it's a very challenging struggle for um, most hospitals. Um, and that we also recognize that each patient's uh, fall risk profile or safety plan really needs to be specific to them uh, because they all have different uh, fall risk factors. So if you see on the right there, our plan was to create a visual aid so that it would be something that everybody could see so that it's not buried in Epic, that if I go into a patient's room and they have a call light on and they want assistance to the bathroom, that there's something that I can look at right away that's going to give me the details that I need to safely move that patient or help them with their mobilization. So um, again, it's kind of like a four square. The, the first goal is to identify the patient's individual fall risk factors and to try to mitigate them. Uh, for example, so if we know that this person has orthostatic hypotension, then we're going to be working on, well, what is the etiology of that? Is that dehydration? Is it a medication? Is it um, uh, something physiological related to Parkinson's disease? And then how are we going to mitigate that? Is it by rehydration, by changing that medication, by uh, applying um, support hose? To, um, to, to alleviate that, that change that increases their risk. We also were very heavily focused on creating the individual mobility plan for each patient. And again, this is a living document. So it's happening every shift to shift and I'll show you in a moment how it looks, uh, but it gets updated or unfortunately downgraded if the patient is um, having a, a decline in, in uh, status. Uh, we are heavily focused on the toileting plan because this is where all of our falls are. So we're trying to be proactive and have that conversation with that patient at the beginning of the shift to say, okay, in the next eight to 12 hours, you're going to have to eliminate. So let's talk together about what that plan is going to look like. Is this a patient that can get up by themselves and unplug their IV from the wall and walk to the bathroom um, and then come back to the uh, bed by themselves and plug themselves back in and put their um, STD um, uh, VTE prevention uh, stockings back on? Or is this a patient that the staff needs to accompany with them in the mobilization uh, to the bathroom and stay with them? Is this a patient that we're going to use a commode with? So again, not having surprises when the patient has to eliminate and having that conversation and having that potential refusal of assistance. And so again, we're very specific to partner with that patient. So it gets into that what matters again that Will talked about is including the patient in the plan and having everybody on board with it. Uh, next slide shows the actual safer mobilization poster. So this is what we have in the room. Um, this is laminated so that it can be uh, erased and updated. So the, the idea is, is that at the beginning of every shift, the, the nurse, the PCA, that's our CNA, and the patient go over this poster and say, okay, these are your current risk factors that might um, put you at a safety risk for, for mobilization. Um, and then we can talk about how we're trying to mitigate those if possible. Then we talk about, so this is your mobility plan and this is your toileting plan. And this is uh, what rehab is recommending to us for today if they're involved. Uh, and then these are the responsibilities that we have for you that we would like your um, cooperation with so that we can get you out of this hospital with the, the maximum functional ability that you can have in a safe way. So again, it's all meant to be proactive for that patient. 
the next slide shows you the actual process that I've already described. And so again, the conversation, the mitigation, the involvement of physical therapy when appropriate, because not every patient is seen by physical therapy. And then really, we found it's really important to um, reinforce this work by auditing to make sure that this is actually happening. And then of course, giving uh, the staff their um, outcomes. And the outcome is not just fall prevention again. This is really meant to be a mobilization strategy. So we are focusing very heavily on maximization of mobilization for each individual patient. So the next slide um, gives you some of the supportive measures that we've put in place to uh, enhance mobilization at our hospital. So we've had mobility volunteers, as it says here, for more than 10 years. Uh, we did temporarily lose them during COVID, but they are now starting to come back. Um, these are generally physical therapy students or other um, students or uh, individuals that are thinking about going to a health profession that want to spend time actually with patient contact. So they are oriented. Um, we actually have um, a tie to one of the physical therapy programs within um, a, our state. Uh, so it becomes part of their clinical work. Um, so that, that's been a really nice way to feed our program. So over these 10 years, we've had close to 20,000 mobility episodes by our mobility volunteers. And I can say that we've only had three falls <laughs> out of all those mobility episodes, and none of those were injurious falls. And also, the, all, almost all of those were patients that the, the nursing staff had assigned to a mobility volunteer that probably should not have been, that they required a higher level of assistance than a volunteer would be giving. So again, what they tend to do is they are encouragers, they um, assist patients that need very minimal assistance or supervision. They, um, again, encourage them to walk with them. Um, and they are also could be a second person when there is um, a staff member that needs um, a second person to either push a wheelchair behind them or perhaps to hold on to the patient. Um, the other things that we've done, uh, again, because we noticed we had many assisted falls, even though the staff were with them, we've implemented gate belts and walkers as our standard for walking all fall risk patients. Um, and this has really helped us to decrease those assisted falls. So again, we know a gate belt doesn't prevent a fall, but it can often recorrect a patient that might be deviating their uh, center of gravity. Um, and it can also help if the patient does need to be lowered to the floor, it can decrease an injury from the, for the patient as well as for the staff. Um, we um, beefed up uh, to make sure that we had adequate numbers of commodes and shower chairs readily available. So again, every, all the equipment that we need, we wanna make sure that it's available and functional for our staff to use. Uh, next slide um, talks about our Dion's egress test. So this is a test that our therapists use when they are mobilizing patients away from the bed because they're trying to understand, does this patient have the strength, balance, and coordination to actually safely walk away from the bed because they don't want that patient to also fall? Um, so again, it's a, a very uh, quick procedure. Our nurses do this with every patient that is identified as a fall risk before they move them away from the bed. So as you can see here, the patient is asked to stand up. They are asked to take uh, march in place. They're asked to, to step, step forward and back with each leg and side to side. And if the patient can pass this test, then we are more sure that we could move this patient away from the bed to start to walk either to the bathroom or into the hallway. Uh, and it's definitely helped us to reduce uh, preventable falls. The next slide shows our progressive mobility level. So this Dion's egress test is part of level four when we are actually um, transitioning to, to assure that the patient who is able to stand is actually able to transfer and then ultimately able to walk. So um, again, this is an example of a progressive mobility uh, Structure, all of our patients are assigned this when they come in so that we do not need mobility orders. Um, again, there is an option to, to have specific orders if the patient's condition warrants it, but uh, we have very few patients on bed rest. Um, again, everything is kind of moved up and the nurses are able to advance the patient on their own 
based on their ability to meet these different criteria at the beginning of every shift. So this is done at the beginning of the shift, and then we're asked to mobilize that patient to that level during that shift. Next slide looks at our um, outcomes from our safer mobilization program. So uh, what I have here is six months worth of falls prior to implementing our safer program and six months after. So this is on six different units. So you can see um, five of these six units had very significant decreases in the number of falls uh, in the uh, six months in implementation of this safer program with the uh, visual cue. We did have one unit CB4 that actually had an increase in falls. This happened to be going on during COVID and there was a very high population of COVID patients on CB4, it was one of our designated units. So we think that that might have had an influence on the data, but again, um, we're continuing to roll this program out to study it and we continue to have very good results around using implementing that that approach of involving patients in their care and having that visual cue. The next slide shows this data just a little bit more over time. So again, you can see we implemented SAFER on those six medicine units um, in the spring of 2020. And then we did continue to see decreases in the number of falls. The next slide shows though, that we were also focused on mobilization. So again, we still have a lot of room for growth here. But what I want to point out is um, the way we read this graph is um, the light pink are the number of patients on each of, at each of these time points on these units combined that were able to mobilize. So in other words, they had a, a progressive mobility score of five, meaning they were ambulatory. But and on the right, you can see the, the number of uh, patients that at, or, or walking episodes that actually occurred in these patients that were greater than 100 feet. So um, you can see our goal was to try to increase this and we did this over time. Um, and we're continuing to really focus on um, mobilizing again that patient as much as we possibly can if that is within their baseline capability. So we continue to, to struggle and we continue to continue to make other uh, interventions. The next slide will show you our, our uh, newest attempt. Um, we are working on this mobility is medicine card that we are uh, giving to patients. So again, we give them a few facts about how important mobility is to their recovery. What are some of the things that can happen if they don't mobilize adequately? And then um, the next slide shows uh, their mobility plan for the day. So um, again, we're asking the patients to fill this out themselves. So again, they would be looking at their poster to say, well, can I walk alone? Or do I need to walk with a staff member? Can I walk with my family? Can I walk with a volunteer? Um, uh, how many times should I or could I get out of bed today? So again, very in, meant to be very individual. And it also incorporates bed and chair exercises, which the patient can do on their own. That's what you'll see on the next slide. We um, have these laminated cards that we give to patients to say that um, we, we really need you to take your mobilization and your recovery serious. So we want you to do some of these exercises when you, uh, when you are in bed or when you are in the chair that don't require the staff to assist you. And so again, we review them with them, we teach them, and then we put it on that mobility card. And that's part of their plan for the day. So we do document that the patients are doing these on their own. We also teach families of patients that potentially may have cognitive impairment that may need uh, additional guidance to be able to do these exercises. The next slide shows um, we are uh, in the process of putting one pound weights and a pedal bike on every unit. Uh, we've been using this intervention um, individually for patients as our uh, geriatric um, resource nurses go around and work with selected patients. We also have a, an area which we call our multi-sensory area where patients come and spend a couple of hours potentially with a, a, a geriatric um, a mentor nurse to do a variety of things. Uh, but part of their work in that specialty room is to actually do exercise and mobilization. 
Um, we had one patient uh, that loved the pedal bike. She was 99 years old. She lived by herself and she kept saying, I need to do this so I can get back to my house. So she would use the pedal bike for her arms, for her legs. She actually wanted it in her room. So we brought it to her room and she'd be pedaling away. She was actually like um, in the multi-sensory room. She was challenging other patients to see if they could pedal as fast as her. But for her, that was like what mattered to her. She was so fixated on her mobilization. And she walked out of here. She happened to be a patient that was here for quite a long time because there were some social issues. She was actually here for like two months and she had the, uh, she had the potential to really have a functional decline in a acute care setting, but she maintained that and that was her thing. And so again, very, um, try, we're trying to be innovative and kind of fun with some of these interventions for patients. Next slide just shows that we're trying to flip the dialogue from fall prevention, uh, yeah, if you can keep clicking, yeah, to safer mobilization. So really that's what we're trying to, 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 uh, to measure. Um, and I think that that's part of the 4M's message is to get away from this real focus on preventing falls because for many people what that means is walk less or mobilize less and then you'll have less falls. Okay, the next slide just kind of summarizes um, what we did. And so again, in, in the inpatient setting to make mobilization a priority, to keep it in the forefront, talk about it, to make sure everybody knows it's everybody's responsibility. This is just not nursing. This is not just physical therapy. Everybody is involved. We have something called the no pass zone where we have um, anybody that spends time on that unit, whether it's food and nutrition, um, whether it's um, environmental services, they're, ta they're, they're taught what to do when they see a fall alarm going off to run into the room to try to um, encourage that patient to, to be safe until a staff member, a nursing staff member gets there. So again, involving patients and families and really talking mobilization up. And my last slide is just how this can also apply to community patients. So again, we know, I know there might be some people on the call that are working in um, an outpatient ambulatory setting. Again, these interventions can be, can be definitely um, tweaked for them as well in their um, home setting or if they're in assisted living. All of these things can be applied there, but we need to continue to focus on the importance of maximizing their mobilization every day, how to integrate safe mobilization into their daily life. Um, some examples that people use are like if the, if the person watches a lot of TV, every time they, there's a commercial that goes on, they get up and they walk around or they do their exercises, um, trying to tie it to their day-to-day -day patterns, um, involving them in formal exercise group programs, and um, there's also some really interesting work coming out about simultaneous cognitive and physical exercise. <laughs> so putting people on a, on a, a pedal bike and also having them do um, cognitive exercises on a, on a tablet. Um, so I think we're gonna hear more about that. Um, so I just like to end with a quote that I just saw when I was leaving our bone and joint center. And I'll just tell you what it is so I don't have it on the slide. It said, exercise is life in motion, move to live. So I thought that that was a great um, mantra <laughs> and wanted to end my presentation with that. So thank you so much for the time. Thank you so much, Christine. So much really uh, great information. And we will be sharing these slides after. I know some people have already asked about that. We'll be sharing the slides and the recording in case you want to take a, a, a deeper look at the references that we saw today or um, some of the tools that were shared. Thank you both Lil and Christine for, for everything that you shared. So now we're gonna open it up for questions and we already um, got two, so we'll start with those. The first was from Shweta. She asked uh, specifically about what matters. So how, um, so Lil, this one's for you. Um, how do you incorporate what matters into the 4M's care plan? Also, do you do this in one visit or multiple visits? Well, I'm not sure if I quite understand, but in the acute care, it automatically drops into the care plan. We automatically have a 65 and older care plan that addresses all the 4Ms, so nobody has to think about it. It's there, it's done, it's all together. Um, we, we ask what matters every shift. Anytime a new provider nurse comes on, there's to update in the, in the uh, EPIC and also on the whiteboards. That's great, thank you. 
And the other question um, was, uh, I think for you, Christine, they asked, are there any suggestions, I guess, for mobility for patients with peripheral neuropathy? Uh, yes. So again, I think um, if you're asking about, you know, maximum mobilization, so again, we want to try to keep them as safe as possible. We want to make sure that they're wearing uh, the appropriate footwear um, to support whatever their neuropathic issue is, um, as well as other supports that they might need to make their mobilization safe. Again, this would be, these would be patients I would be definitely involve um, some of our um, our rehab specialists on to try to maximize their plan of care. Um, and again, I think it goes with um, knowing what is safe for that patient. So for example, we, we have our physical therapists that spend time with our nurses and our PCAs that say, if you have a patient that has right leg weakness, this is, would be a way for you to stand or to place your own leg against the back of their leg so that their knee does not um, bend. Uh, so that would be that type of an intervention, I think. It depends on where the peripheral neuropathy is and what the extent is. But that would be what I'd be doing is make it very individual to that patient and get a, um, a, a reference from one of those uh, other um, health professionals and then implement that as part of that mobility plan. Thank you. Um, any other questions before we wrap up? I think we can take maybe one more. Um, I, I have a question. So for, for both of you, um, why, what do you think is the unique role that nurses play? And what is your, uh, I guess, what matters for this type of work and why you think it's important for your role as a nurse? Um, so Christine or Lil? Yeah, well, I mean, it's uh, integral to what we do. Yeah. <laughs> I, and it's, I, mean, I don't think it takes much. I mean, the four M's is, is such a great way of summarizing what every patient should get, right. even if it's not somebody over the age of 70, but I know right. we're focusing on older adults, right. but it should, this should be everybody. And it, yeah. it's, it's integral to nursing. So that's all I can say is that it's, it, it wasn't a, any kind of a leap, like Will said, it was, it's not difficult to see the value. Uh, I think this just structures right. things better so that you can, it makes sense to everybody um, when you put it in these buckets, but right. it's and, nothing, and for, nothing new. No, and Christine's right. I mean, that's why it's really not, the implementation of this is not so difficult because it's really what we do anyway, right? As, as nurses and providers, we're concerned about what matters, what medications you're on, if you're up and out of bed, Nothing new, but it does bring the structure that I think that we've uh, lacked to, to really push this um, work forward. Right, and it shows how they're all integral to one another. Right. Like if you look at the actual 4M diagrams, it talks about how you, you don't just focus on one of the Ms. Right. Because every M affects the other M right. um, at the same time, yeah. That's great, very true. One last question before we wrap up. Um, Christine, can you talk about obesity in falls? Is that something that you've um, considered in this in your mobility plan? Sure. Yeah. So again, um, very important to um, to understand that there are different approaches based on the patient's weight. Um, I think the major thing is to be sure that you have the equipment that you need that's appropriate for that patient. So, for example, we do require um, that all staff have gait belts. So if we need a, um, a bariatric gait belt, we've made that very accessible to everyone for that patient and made sure that it's available so that we can mobilize that person safely. The same thing with any assistive equipment that we're using, we have to make sure that it, it gets into, um, you know, it meets their needs. And then lastly, to be sure that we have adequate numbers of personnel supporting that person so that the patient does not get injured as well as the staff members. But I think that's the focus. So, so the, the, the weight doesn't limit the mobilization, it just alters the plan. Great, thank you so much. Well, we are unfortunately out of time. We really appreciate both of your, your expertise and sharing the resources that you've been able to 
put together, I um, wanted to ask you all to please help us by completing an evaluation. This is a knowledge survey and evaluation. We wanna know if you learned anything today. It's really important to this, the whole program and to the GWEP program. Um, you can actually click on the link that uh, Isabel A put into the chat, or you can hold up your camera from, from your phone and it will open the link automatically. And you can uh, open it now and, and complete it later today if you don't have a moment right now. Uh, we'll also email it out to you, but we really appreciate all of your time today. I want to make sure to invite you to our next session next week on Thursday, June 17th. We're at the same time, we're gonna be focusing on this, the other two M's that we didn't talk about today, mentation and medication. So we invite you to join us for that. And if you missed the first session, we have it recorded and we will send out a, a, a link to that as well if you are interested in watching that. And the last session will be on June 24th and we're gonna be talking about putting it all together. What are the things we should be thinking about um, as this is implemented in our healthcare systems and also what resources do we have here in South Florida to help us do that. Thank you again for your time today. I'll leave you all with this slide. We uh, look forward to seeing you next week. Thanks everyone. <laughs>